This afternoon, I would like to share with you a reading exercise in 2 Kings 20, verse 1 to 11, in which King Hezekiah first became seriously ill and risked to die. He begs God that this should not happen, and he is told by the prophet Isaiah that he will be all right. To be sure that this will indeed happen, he asks for a very curious sign. The shadow on the st stairs of his father Ahaz, who has a sundial, must retrace his steps. And that is what eventually happens. How should or can we, readers, explain this happening? It is my intention to find a plausible answer to this, which I will submit to you for your assessment. First, let's have a close reading of this text. Then, with attention to its composition, the course of the narrative, and the discrepancies that hinder the understanding of 2 Kings 21 to 11. So here is the text. Let's uh, read it. In those days, Hezekiah was sick unto death, and came to him Isaiah, son, son of Amos, the prophet. I follow the Hebrew syntax, as you can see. And he said unto him, Thus says Adonai, Set your house in her order, and you, for you shall die, and you shall not live. And he turned his face to the wall, and he prayed to Adonai, saying, O oh Adonai, remember now, I implore you, how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with an undivided heart, and the good I have done in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah was gone out of the middle court that the word of Adonai came to him, saying, Return, and you will say to Hezekiah, Prince of my people, thus says Adonai the God of David your father. I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears. Well, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of Adonai, and I will add to your days fifty years. Out of the hand of the king of Assyria I will deliver you and this city. I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of David my servant. And Isaiah said, Take a cake of figs. And they took and let it on the boil, and he lived or recovered. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What shall be the sign that Adonai will heal me, and that I shall go up on the third day to the house of Adonai? And Isaiah said, This is a sign to you from Adonai, that Adonai will do the thing that he has spoken. The shadow has gone forward or advanced ten steps, shall it retreat ten steps? And Hezekiah said, Ah, it's a light thing for the shadow to extend ten steps. Nine, that the shadow retreat backward ten steps. And Isaiah the prophet cried to Adonai, and he caused to retreat the shadow on the steps, by which it had gone down on the steps of Ahaz. Well, Let's look at the composition of it. It's quite easy. Verse 1 to 3, it's an illness scene with a focus on Hezekiah's prayer. Then a promise scene with a focus on Hezekiah's healing. And then a shadow scene with a focus on Hezekiah's quest for a sign. Key notions and key words are important to indicate. To be sick, and to heal, to die and to live, to pray and to weep, to deliver or defend this city. And then from verse 8 to 11, the sign mentioned twice, the shadow mentioned four times. 
to go forward, to extend, and to go down, and the opposite, to retreat, and this three times. Ten steps, five times each being mentioned. So, when we look at uh, the first seven verses, we can see different sequences. Sick unto death, Isaiah came, says Adonai, you shall die, not live. He prayed, he wept, and then returned. Isaiah has to return. Then, word of Adonai, I heard your prayer, I saw your tears, and I will heal you. You see very clearly how the narrative evolves and the different opposites or uh, complements. Here, he lived or he recovered. Now, in verses 9 to 11, uh, 8 to 11, you have the shadow has gone forward, 10 steps. Shall it retreat? Ten steps. It's easy to the shadow, for the shadow to extend ten steps. The shadow must retreat backward ten steps. Adonai calls to retreat the shadow ten steps, by which it had gone down on the steps of Ahaz backward ten steps. You see the strong emphasis, the repetition. It is really sounding. Yeah, 10 steps, 10 steps, 10 steps, 10 steps, and then going forward, retreating, advancing, retreating. I think here we have a clear view on uh, the proposition and the sequences of this uh, uh, narrative. Now, let us uh, look at the, uh, the obstacle, if you like, that is the retreat of the shadow. What consequences does this entail? As a biblical scientist, yeah, I was able to find out a few things about this problem, but I prefer to leave the explanation for a natural scientist honoring the saying, cockroach stick to your trade. And so I have asked Lyndon to do this for us, and he graciously accepted it. Please, Lyndon. For many years, this passage would have given no problem to believers. Uh, the earth was understood to be immovable and at the centre of the universe as they conceived it. The sun and the moon were both fairly small. They both were of the same size. Scientists would say they subtend the same solid angle to the human eye. And to think of God as clutching the sun and moving it one way, whether forward or backwards for that matter, would have caused them little grief, scientific or theological. But then when the Copernican Revolution arrived in the early 1600s, that would have changed dramatically. <clears throat> These texts were some of those that were put up against Galileo uh, as arguments for the fact that the Bible teaches that the earth is stationary and that the sun uh, is what moves around it. That's why God was able to do these things. As the evidence stacked up to the contrary, however, and we generally accepted that the Christian church took about 200 years to generally accept uh, this concept, we're left with, with quite a problem. We know that day and night are not caused by the sun going around the earth, but by the earth rotating about its axis. And at the earth's equator, there is a distance around the equator of about 40,000 kilometers. We obviously go around in about 24 hours. So we're looking at a speed of an object at the equator of something like 1,500 kilometers per hour as we, as we circle. At the latitude of Jerusalem, it would be a little bit less, but it's still very substantial. All objects traveling at speeds have what is called kinetic energy. 
And the kinetic energy is a function of the velocity squared, namely multiplied by itself, which is the reason that things travelling fast have such high and destructive energies. That's what makes a bullet so dangerous. That's what makes hitting a tree when we're motoring uh, such a devastating experience because that kinetic energy has to be dissipated. And what we're looking at on the surface here is a massive problem of those dimensions. If the Earth were to suddenly stop or reverse its motion, the, the huge destructive energy releases involved don't bear imagining. As far as we were concerned, we would say impossible. As far as if we recognise a God who can do everything, then we can say, well, perhaps God could do this in such strange ways. But it's such an implausibility that it makes us ask the question as to whether or not God has shown a predisposition to work like that in nature. So that's, in a nutshell, the kind of problem that we encounter as modern, scientifically aware, kinetic energy equals a half mv squared big three. Thank you. Thank you, Lyndon. Can I put on the screen what I have found? Yes, and not only is uh, blocking the understanding of this text, yeah, Hezekiah must die prematurely, although, according to the Torah, five books of Moses, he showed an exemplary behavior. How to explain this contradiction? In the beginning of chapter 18, it is being said that he was really 100% uh, faithful to the to, to Torah in his behavior. And now he stresses the fact that he did and he must die. Adonai at once this kind, this kind of his uh, decision. Does he want to make up? He sends Isaiah back and says, okay, change the message. He will not die, but he will uh, live. Does he want to make up for his mistake? Or is God compassionate for the king's distress and pleading? Another problem? How do 50 more years to live relate with the 10 steps retreating of the shadow? Why does Ezekiah's healing go hand in hand with the deliverance of his deliverance and that of Jerusalem? And, and of course, how to explain that the prayer of a sick man genera generates besides his healing, also in parallel, the deliverance of the city of Jerusalem. And then the most important problem, how can an earnest prayer for a sign cause God to disrupt the entire cosmos? This is what I found, and you can uh, uh, compare it with what Lyndon said. Perhaps there are one or two details more. The earth cannot suddenly stop. For this, you need mega gigantic superhuman forces. That is what Lyndon said. The atmosphere rotates with the earth and is connected to gravity. If the earth breaks with considerable forces, all non fixed objects, animals, people, whatever, would rise in the air provided they exceed. 11 kilometers per second. Very large scale disasters would happen at the level of oceans, lakes, rivers, atmospheric currents at the level of human life. And this is important. The circumference of the Earth at the equator is, as Lyndon said, 40,000 kilometers, which is covered in 24 hours. I'm repeating now what he said. That is, in fact, 1,666 kilometers per hour. At the latitude of Jerusalem, this is important because it's, we are dealing with a, a narrative about Jerusalem, which is at 31 degrees, and then a calculation, this comes to 1,470 kilometers per hour. That is what is involved when you read this narrative. So, uh, as Bible readers, we are forced to make a choice between two options. Is the event to be considered as a miracle? God interferes against the laws of nature, 
and they are mega laws, or should its mention in this narrative be considered as an absurdity? And one can understand that some good thinking people, not too religious, say this Bible is not worthwhile because this is nonsense. Or is there a third option? And to explore this, it may help to include the two previous chapters, 18 and 19, in Two Kings. Okay, how to understand the suggested disruption of the cosmos? Options. The narrative tells of a miracle that Adonai performed. He is a creator of the cosmos and the inventor of physical astronomical laws. So the believing reader will consider this nat narrative as a matter of faith. Do you choose that option? What the net narrative suggests is not possible, the second option. This is contrary to common sense, to all logic. So the secular reader would consider that this narrative as absurd and the narrative should not be taken seriously. So we see here the two options. And uh, all of us, we are people who have faith in God, we believe, we see him as a creator, uh, as one who intervenes in lives. So we are stuck with this problem. And if we choose, choose for a miracle, then uh, we are facing considerable problems if we have uh, an exchange with people who find it nonsense. Number three, the reader is invited to look for a solution, to be able to take the meaning of this narrative as convincing. And that is what I will try to do here. So let us have a close reading. We did it uh, for uh, chapter 20, verse 1 to 11. Let's take the two previous chapters. Verse 18, ver uh, chapter 18, verse 1 introduces King Hezekiah and it runs through to chapter 20, the end of chapter 20. So here you see from chapter 20 we go backwards yeah, to chapter 18 and 19. Okay, the narrative is set in the uh, 14th year of Hezekiah's reign. It is preceded and introduced by a short presentation of Hezekiah Hezekiah himself and what he has come accomplished. Much attention is paid to his relationship with Israel's God Adonai. Then it is mentioned that in the fourth year, in his fourth year, an Assyrian army made an invasion into Israel, the northern country, and wiped it from the map. The whole nation is gone, uh, capital Samaria is being destroyed, the people are being deported. So here we have them, yeah? We have the prologue, the first eight verses, which I just indicated. Then we have a war narrative, the king of Assyria, not the one I just mentioned, but his successor, Sennacherib. He comes, yes, and uh, he comes up to uh, Jerusalem to take it and to destroy it, and then finally, the sickness and healing narrative. So, okay. Um, I suppose that most of you don't remember the contents of this war narrative. So let's run through its outline with an eye for clear repetition as we progress through the text. The narrator here clearly emphasizes the military campaign of the Assyrian king who comes to Jerusalem after taking all the land of Judah with his army, and he sends messengers, three messengers, with, who, who ridicule, ridicule Hezekiah and Israel's God three times on uh, his behalf. So let's go through it. You can already see verses 1 to 8 uh, corresponds to the prologue introducing Hezekiah. Then uh, Salmanasser went up against Samaria and took it. We told it. And then from verse 13, Sennacherib's army went up against Jerusalem. 
Ezekiah pays tribute and says to him, I have sinned, which means, well, I uh, uh, stopped obeying you as an overlord, as a vassal. I did not do what you asked. And uh, he begs, yeah, and uh, he pays uh, with silver of uh, the temple and of his palace. Then the army of the king of uh, Assyria went up against Jerusalem. The first speech of the three ambassadors or messengers um, to Ezekiah's messengers who are on the walls with the people of Jerusalem, yeah, and the messages don't trust in Egypt. Ezekiah had made an alliance with the Egyptians. Don't trust Adonai, yeah, because it's Adonai who said to me, go up. He made me go up to Jerusalem. The second speech of Sennacherib's messengers to Jerusalem is, do not Ezekiah, you have not to trust in him and not in Adonai, for Adonai will not deliver. Now, here you see the repetitions. He went up, he went up, he went up, and he made me go up. And then seven times the verb to deliver is being mentioned. He will not be able to deliver you. Egypt will not be able. The king will not be able. So to undermine the confidence of the people of Jerusalem and of Ezekiah. Then Ezekiah hears these words and mourns. He asks Isaiah to pray. He doesn't pray himself. And then Adonai replies and says, okay, I will cause a serious king to retreat. He has come up, he has come up, he has come up, to retreat. The third speech of Sennacherib's messengers to Ezekiah is, do not trust in your God, he will not deliver you. Again, this verb, to deliver. Ezekiah finally goes up to the temple. He got also a letter from the king of Assyria and he praises Adonai as the only living God, a, pray, a prayer for deliverance, a magnificent confession. You should read it. It's powerful. Uh, it's honoring God. It's expressing really what Ezekiah thinks. He had been extremely afraid. He did not show himself uh, to this messenger of uh, the king of Assyria. He was hidden. Yes, and now he is a very strong man. He is not tearing his clo clothes anymore. He is not mourning. He is there and he stands with a lot of character. Yes, uh, in the temple. Then Adonai answers to the prayer of Hezekiah. I have heard your prayer. Second, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, will not come into this city. He will retreat. And then during the night, the messenger of Adonai, now the translations say the angel, yeah, kills other than 85,000 Assyrians and Sennacherib retreats to Nineveh and is killed by his two sons. And then we have the text uh, we have been uh, looking at, the illness and the healing and the deliverance of Ezekiah and the going forward of the shadow and it retreats backwards. See again the repetitions. To retreat, he will retreat, he will not come into. Yes, he retreats and it retreats. So the point of the deliverance in the former part, seven times to deliver, is being repeated here. He will not deliver you. He prays for deliverance and is the deliverance is a fact. So when we look at this, it's clearly the narrator who presents this to his readers or his hearers, who is putting a lot of emphasis. And this is extremely important when we read narratives, Bible stories, chapters, that we look at words. Words are the bricks of uh, uh, a narrative, of a story, or of a psalm, or whatever. So we need to pay attention to it. Okay. Um, the narrative sequences of this war narrative can be 
presented as follows. The opposites are really evident. Sennacher is coming up to Jerusalem to destroy and the opposite, yeah, his retreat and not coming into the city, number one. Number two, Hezekiah will not be able to live, deliver Jerusalem. Adonai will deliver him and Jerusalem. And then, and right in the center of Hezekiah's prayer, we have here, yeah, Adonai save us, I, Hezekiah, pray to you. You see here clearly the opposites. Sennacherib came up. I have come up to destroy. By the way, he came up. He shall retreat and not come into the city. Hezekiah will not be able to deliver you. I, Adonai, will deliver you and this, and this city. Adonai, save us. I beg you. I pray to you. So, while going through this illness story, gets uh, ill, he will die, then he gets a promise, and then finally the, the matter of the, the shadow. When you read this, and you have a good memory of these two preceding chapters, yes, then you will experience, and allow me, I apologize to use some French expression, déjà vu, Australians, English, Americans say déjà vu, yeah? Huh? But I will switch it to déjà lu, already not seen, but read. I have read it, this before, I have seen this before. This word, this idea, this sentence, this thing, I've seen it before. So a feeling of recognition, I, I recognize that, I, I see, I remember, yeah? And indeed, several elements in it, in the illness narrative and shadow narrative, will bring the reader back to these two chapters, the war narrative. In fact, he will consciously or not consciously effectuate some retrograde backwards reading movements. So he is here, he says, okay, I will deliver you. And then going forward, backward, yeah, I will deliver you. Uh, he, will, he will come up and so on and so on. And I can count about 10. Let's look at it. Ezekiah, I have walked before you in faithfulness and with an undivided heart and the good I have done in your eyes in the sickness or the illness narrative. In 18 to 19, Ezekiah did which was right in the eyes of Adonai according to all that David his father had done. Ezekiah says it while he is praying and the narrator introducing Ezekiah is indicating that that indeed is the case. He is a model Torah practitioner and uh, on the level of David. And in fact, he even surpasses David. It says also in this text that no other king before or after him stood up. Second point. Ezekiah wept bitterly. The other night said, I have seen your tears. When you read only this text of the illness of Ezekiah, you won't see the connection. If you have read chapter 8 and uh, 19, you will see Ezekiah heard it that he um, um, he, he, he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth. The, the weeping is there, the anguish is there. Um, when in the illness uh, narrative, thus says Adonai, thus says Adonai, the God of Israel, it is an echo of thus says Adonai in chapter 19, verse 6, verse 32, thus says Adonai, the God of Israel, in verse 20. In chapter 19. A fourth one. Ezekiah prayed to Adonai and Adonai says, I've heard your prayer. In chapter 19, Ezekiah prayed before Adonai. I have heard your prayer, says God, um, about King Sennacherib. Again, a connection, a repetition as a way of saying it. 
Then number five, yeah, Adonai, Adonai says, you shall go up to the house of Adonai, and Hezekiah says, that I shall go up on the third day to the house of Adonai. What does it say in chapter 19? Hezekiah went into the house of Adonai, he went up into the house of Adonai. See clearly these connections in the illness uh, uh, narrative. There are indications, and these indications bring the reader back to what he has read before. And it's not finished because there are about 10 in total. Here we go again. Isaiah, what shall be the sign that Adonai will heal me? Isaiah said, this is the sign to you uh, from Adonai. But in chapter 19, Adonai said, this shall be the sign for you. Adonai, I will heal you in the sickness uh, narrative. Adonai said, you shall eat and you shall, uh, shall sow, reap, plant vineyards and eat their, their fruit, which is a sign, of course, the uh, Assyrian uh, army, just a moment, uh, army is destroying everything and uh, there is a risk of a big, big famine, but there will be a future. Then Adonai says, I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. Chapter 19, Adonai, I will defend this city to save it. Chapter 20, Adonai, for my own sake and for the sake of David, my servant. Adonai, for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And then the tenth, Isaiah said, shall it retreat ten steps? That the shadow retreat backward ten steps? And he, Adonai, calls to retreat the shadow on the steps. And in chapter 19, Adonai said, and shall retreat to his own land. Isaiah, no, uh, Sennacherib will retreat to his own land. I will make you retreat on the way by which you came, by the way that you came, that he came, by the same he will retreat. Sennacherib uh, went and retreated. Uh, I can't help it, but it's so obvious that there is a link, a connection between the illness and shadow narrative with this war narrative. You cannot deny that. So, what are the observations we have made? First of all, a three-part repeated scenario suggests that the two narratives, yes, uh, must be read in parallel and be see, seen related. First, the siege, and then the illness. Confession, supplication, retreat, and healing. Number two, what is first told extensively in the war narrative, chapters 18 and 19, then briefly recounted in the illness narrative, with identical or analogous lexical and syntactic data confirm and reinforms the here suggested relationship. Semantic similarities add extra color to the concern parallelism. Number three, if this intra-textual, we speak about intra because they are within the cycle of narratives of Isaiah, we can also make a step to intertextual relationship, and I can do that if time permits, to the war narrative about David and Goliath. But that's another thing. Here is intra-textual observation. If they make sense, then there is a clear and light correlation between Isaiah's panic and weeping over his deadly illness and his cringing before a serious king, and thus of his initial lack of faith in Adonai, and between the retreat of Sennacherib and that of the shadow on the stairway of King Ahaz. Number four, all illogic 
characteristics and ungrammaticalities, I will explain this term a bit later, that the reader perceives when reading the autonomous text or the independent text of chapter 20, verse 1 to 11, are brought to light intratextually via Kings, 2 Kings 18 and 19. So the number of question marks in this illness and shadow narrative are being resolved by going backwards to this war narrative in 18 and 19. So what is an ungrammaticality? That is a term in literature. Michael Rifatera um, was a professor at Columbia University, New York, for about 50 years, Frenchman, yeah? And uh, he precises that the reader does not only discover the intertext, chapter 18 and 19 is the intertext, chapter 20 is the text, the text and the intertext, yeah? Not only discover the intertext through the heterogeneity in the text, but also through the presence of ungrammaticality. This word in French, yeah? He defines the latter as follows. An ungrammaticality, grammar, it's not grammatic, grammaticality sound. It's not grammar-like sound. It concerns any textual data which give the reading the feeling that the rule is being violated. It doesn't make sense. It's not correct. It's a mistake. Yeah? In this narrative, the cosmos being disrupted. That is not logic. That's an ungrammaticality. Yeah? It is therefore about text which exhibit semantic anomalies when applied to reality. When you look at it, you read it and say, this doesn't cost, uh, correspond to our life, to our situation, to nature, and so on. Only thanks to the detour through the intertext, chapter 18 and 19, the reader analyze and understand every ungrammaticality he encounters. So the problem of the shadow, I think you start feeling where we are heading, yeah? The problem of the shadow is being solved by reading backwards, chapter 18 and 19, have all the elements there, and then in a re re retroactive move back to chapter 20, this ungrammaticality can be on a lexical, syntactic or semantic level. Now, each time it is sent as a dis, uh, distortion of a norm or an incompatibility with the context. It imposes an image of the intertext because the intertext, chapter 18 and 19, it makes him feel that there is a solution for this, this difficulty. So we read the text and something is not logic, we should not uh, say, okay, I accept it because I read the Bible literally, it's okay. Yeah, I don't understand it, but God has all the wisdom, so I accept it. Uh, the Bible writer who knows what he says, no. When there is something that is not clear, what is a problem, you cannot understand it, yes, that makes us uh, invite to look for a solution. And that is what I have tried to do with the shadow that is retreating, which naturally it is impossible, and therefore we can also listen to another specialist in literature, also on intertextuality, and ungrammaticality must warn the reader. So you see something, you can't understand it, you must be warned. If he perceives the riddle, he solves it by appealing to the intertext. Of course, he needs to find the intertext, because if he doesn't find it, then there's a problem. Whose ungrammaticality uh, is a trace. So the ungrammaticality in a text is a trace to the intertext. Question is whether you find the intertext. Such an approach to perception implies an erudite reader who interpret the details of the text. So when we read the Bible, we need to be close readers. 
not negligent, superficial. We need to be close readers. In fact, even superb close readers. The recog recognition of the intertextuality, so the relationship between the text, the identification and the bringing to light of the issue are linked here. Once the intertext is recognized, chapter 18 and 19, whether it's openly read or whether a contradiction betrays it in a fragment that evokes it, it's up to the reader who is held up by this difficulty which he tries to clarify, to identify. So, where are we? Let's uh, uh, take the balance now, yeah? Uh, make the balance now and the role of the shadow can be specified. The narrative, the illness and shadow narrative can indeed be qualified without a doubt as a metaphorical narrative with a didactical scope. The story is being told, first the war narrative extensively, and now the lesson to be drawn from it, the illness and shadow narrative in a didactical scope. Most of the narratives in the Bible yeah, have a didactical, pedagogical scope, not a theological in the uh, fundamentalist uh, or philosophical sense, yeah, but to learn something from it. Hezekiah's illness can be seen as his immobilization or paralysis in the face of Sennacherib's campaign. He doesn't show himself, he tears his clothes, he mourns, but he hides. Yeah? It symbolizes his lack of confidence in Adonai during the siege of Jerusalem. This immediately explains his absence during the negotiations of the three representatives on both sides. His plea and confession to Adonai in the temple express his hope for the deliverance of Jerusalem. The advancing shadow or descending downwards on the solar staircase of King Aegis represents the ascending and the coming of the Assyrian army. And the retreat of the shadow points to the retreat of Sennacherib towards his homeland. Conclusion. The reader should then not conclude that the whole cosmos depended on Hezekiah's plea, nor that it was disturbed by it. I think I have still some 10 minutes, huh? okay? Okay, conclusions. Adonai responds positively to Hezekiah's poignant appeal in that he refers to his behavior in harmony with the Torah which applies to the years of, the, of his reign before his rebellion against the Assyrian king and appears to be going hand in hand with his confession of total confidence in Adonai. So this is really parallel. The beginning of his reign, yeah, total behavior, yes, with his prayer in confession in the temple. Hezekiah heals and is being delivered together with Jerusalem from Sennacherib's uh, threat. Pardon. Then number three, the brief illness and healing narrative is therefore tightly connected with the elaborate war narrative. So the phrase in those days, verse one in chapter 20, he became sick in those days, yes, refers to the 14th year of King Hezekiah when Sennacherib comes up with his army. This reading exercise brings to light that textual and intratextual readings are imposed upon the reader. During the reading process is only the junior partner of the text which proves itself to be the senior partner. So, a bit of theory in terms of explanation to round off this reading exercise. First makes it clear that linguistic, literary and intertextual reading and analysis 
encourage historical and scientific sobriety. So when we do this, then we must be on our guards and not draw too easily conclusions that it was exactly this way that it has been presented. The examined text do not have a referential function. You know what that means? Uh, something happens, you write it down exactly as you described, how st that's a referential function. No, huh? but a literary uh, function. It's literature. The Bible, the Hebrew Bible, is world literature. It's magnificent. It is nearly perfect. You look at the, a painting of Rubens. Come to Antwerp in my native city and come and see the cathedral, the painting uh, of uh, the taking down of Jesus on the cross. You look at it. You see the composition. You see the colors. You see the, the, the eyes, the faces, of the, and the, the movements. It is absolutely fabulous. But underneath, there are the drawings. And they, with techniques, they can bring up the drawings. And that is what we have to do with Bible text, because they are literary arts of work, magnificent things. We should not go over it and read it just like, oh, it's nice, it's beautiful, and uh, that's it. No, they are really top quality. Secondly, ambiguities, difficulties, and grammaticalities should not be interpreted immediately as interventions by editors. What often happens? Oh, this is of a later date. Oh, that is being inserted. Nor as tools for divisions. Oh, this part of the text has to be separated because it's earlier and so on and so on. The diachronic, what they call, eh, reflection is therefore best done after a literary reading. And then finally, I hope it's not too theoretical, but I need to, to do this. Finally, it appears that Biblical exegesis, explanation of Bible text, benefits from analytical methods provided by the linguistic and literary sciences. It's not just the Bible and that's it. No, there is a, a vast a mass, uh, uh, ocean of literature with skills, with techniques, with uh, the uh, compositions and so on and so on. And when we listen and when we learn from them, it is to great benefit for us when we try to approach the Bible because they are complementary, converging, and have a corrective effect. I hope that this last part was not too theoretical, but uh, I need uh, to round it up like this. And thank you for your attention. Linden, the word is yours. Thank you, Rudy. Sit down and have a, a break for a moment. Rudy has only been in Australia a couple of days and had some minor surgery before he came, so he's had to had to really work hard adjusting to our time scales and uh, and such. And, and yeah, most definitely, and not sleeping so well sometimes at night. Uh, Brian, I'll ask you, if you don't mind, just to hand out those offering bags for us. Offering bags are such a novelty these days, it's almost worth getting them out. It's almost a pleasure to put things in them. Uh, so I hope that that's your experience. We don't have a lot planned on the, uh, on the forum front uh, for the next few months. Uh, we have a few ideas that are in gestation. Uh, we have thought maybe of trying to do a, a get together at a, uh, a bit of a conference next year, but you'll hear more about that when the idea is, is better formed. But if anyone does have suggestions uh, on topics uh, that we might address, please approach one of our committee. There are a number of us here today. Uh, Brian is here, Howard is here, uh, Jeff is of course away, uh, but we, we welcome your suggestions and if from your wide circle of acquaintances, you learn of someone visiting our shores. Uh, Kurumbong is, after all, the centre of the world, and most people pass through at some time or another. Then, uh, then let us know. We are interested in ideas. 
Uh, you, well, you can imagine the discussions taking place in the Rogers home at the moment. Rudy and I sit there in front of the fire and Rudy, well, have, you, have you thought of this? And almost invariably, I haven't thought of that. Uh, so then follows another hour and a half of something a little different, a little new, something on which I can reflect. Uh, no one has ever accused Rudy of being superficial uh, or lightweight. Uh, so if you've had to think hard uh, today, that's what you came here to do. And uh, Rudy, we're delighted in the way that you introduce your material. You have something thought out, you put it before us to evaluate. Uh, you are happy to, to, to submit to judgment and you think that the strength of the case is sufficient to, uh, to carry the day. Well, you've heard it all. Does anyone have suggestion? Sorry, any questions uh, that uh, you would like to ask? I have, I have one that I can ask you to lead off, Rudy. Uh, as I listen to you, I realise that perhaps one of my comments made when I came up may not have been quite so so accurate after all, and you may have a comment to make on this. I made the point that uh, for the original hearers, this would not have represented any particular difficulty because of the cosmology that they had assumed. On the other hand, your treatment suggests that perhaps they did and that these, and I'm trying to think of the word now, ungrammaticalities uh, that, that are pointers to the need for a search for resolution uh, would have perhaps been relevant for them as well. But if, if they didn't have all of the scientific problems that we have when we think of this event taking place, um, their problems certainly couldn't have been as severe as ours, but perhaps there was a sense in which there was a very natural motion of the sun across the heavens and for, for it to come back would have, would have still represented a fairly serious discontinuity for them. Is there any evidence that that is the case? With Linden, we know that uh, there will be a difficult question, and then uh, you, have to try, you have to try to give a simple answer. Um, the, the main problem with us readers is that we live in another kind of culture of science, of technology, of uh, economics, and so on and so on. Yes, and we've lost perhaps that the ab aboriginals probably certainly and the ancient belgians like they called them and you know them from asterix yes uh, <laughs> they had a, a telling culture they tell stories they tell they tell from generation to generation uh, and so they have no scientific questions no question when joshua uh, is fighting and uh, he needs more time, he says, uh, Son, stand still. That's what the translations say. Moon, stand still. No, in fact, he says that's the first meaning of this Hebrew verb, shut up, shut up. And this is a telling culture, yeah, storytelling culture. And uh, in fact, it's in this case, the sun and the moon are gods. And the, the people he's fighting, yeah, they believe in these gods. And he is there on behalf, uh, on, on, uh, in the name of the God of Israel and the creator of the world. And say, shut up, shut up. This is a story. Now, we do not have to approach this in a scientific way. Is this possible? because then we have the same problem as this one, because if the sun has to stand still, now we have heard the consequences but, uh, because of the rotation of the earth. So it's always about learning something about your relationship with God and the relationship with other people. And uh, yeah, it's so simple as that. It's another culture. And I've seen during uh, my uh, teaching at the University of Brussels, I had quite some Africans. They understood the Old Testament much better than uh, the, the Belgian and the French speaking uh, because they reason not like us, but they feel and they think 
Yeah, and they're lived by stories. I don't know whether that answer satisfies you, but we need, when we open the Bible, we need always to think, wait a minute, I'm a Greek person, I'm a Roman person, yes, I'm reading now text from a total different culture. Like, for example, when we would read the Vedas from the Hindus. We, we, must, not, we must not have the pretension to be able to explain them if we are not Hindus, yes? So we are not Hebrews. We don't have to explain them. We have to listen to them and to enjoy them and to learn from them and, and to feel something within us in our relationship with our fellow men and, and with God. I don't know if that is satisfactory. Rudy, I can ask you more about this tonight, so I won't pursue this one, but I'll give the the floor to other people if there are other questions. If yes, Joan. I've always been curious about Joan and the way. <laughs> story. Was that a myth? Just a story that was told from generation to generation? Or was it something that happened? The, the question concerns Jonah and the whale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we were chatting and uh, uh, I said, well, when you ask Socrates what is truth, he will explain you uh, definition uh, by uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, yes, and, uh, and you ask a prophet, a Bible writer or a rabbi what is true, he will tell you a story. And stories are so powerful. So, the truth is not what it literally says, but what it means, the lesson you can draw from it. And what a powerful lesson is this in this little booklet of Jonah. There is an Israelite who feels superior to these Ninevites, these sinners, and he doesn't want to go. And in fact, the writer of this little booklet is accusing this Israelite Jonah and with him the whole people of being selfish and that is the time of King Jeroboam II and uh, you read the book of Amos, you read the book of Hosea and you know what the climate was about superiority, arrogance, God is with us, not with trust, exactly that, yes, uh, so read it as a Jew, read it as a child and think about it what does it mean? Uh, you know this story about Jesus and the disciples on the Sea of Galilee? There's a storm. Yeah? Okay? And uh, we read this. Oh, okay. Oh, these, these disciples, they are so fearful in panic and so on and so on. And then Jesus uh, calms the storm and, and, and the wind and it's okay. And then uh, who is this that he can do that? Every Christian, perhaps with an exception, yeah, will say, no, it's normal. Jesus is the creator. That's it. That's it. Yeah, it's not that. It's a story. A story to make a point, not that Jesus is the creator. I'm not going to, into that topic, but that is not the point. But if you are a Jew and you visit the synagogue every week, yeah, and you have been taught by the rabbis, you went to the Jewish school, yes, and you heard every Sabbath the stories and every year the same cycle, then automatically you make an association, like here, intertextual. You make a bridge with another story in the Hebrew Bible. Which story? Automatically from the story of Jesus in the storm, you make a bridge this retrograde reading movement to somewhere else in the Hebrew Bible. Which story? The one of Jonah. You take it and read it, chapter 1, and you put this little story in Mark next to it, and you will see at least 15, 16, 17 connections. It's a mirror story. It is parallel in the same sequence what does that mean that 
The one who hears Mark reading out loud of, he's reading himself the text of Mark, as a Jew, he immediately goes to the book of Jonah. Why? Because there they were the sailormen, they were afraid, in panic, Jonah was sleeping, you, you make the connections. And what was the, the result of the story? Who made the storm stop and the wind lay down? Who? I'm, I'm curious. Who? Who did that? Sorry? I don't Jonah. Think. Jonah. Jonah did. Because he said, throw me in the sea and it will be. And they threw him in the sea and it was gone. Now, this is important. Who is this man who can do that? Well, Jonah did it. So now the reader, when he hears Mark telling this, is invited yeah, to reflect upon these two men, these two men, Jesus and Jonah. Jonah as a prophet he doesn't want to go to the pagans. Jesus is a prophet, because that's the consequence of this story. And he out of himself decides to go to Gadara, Geraza, where only pagans live. And that's it. Now, then you ask, well, but was he in the well? It's a story. Look at it very closely. He's praying. Do you sit in, as some children Bibles put, um, uh, is he praying, you know, in some sweet little fire, yes? But the prayer has nothing to do with his being in the belly of the, of the, 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 the fish. With the children? Yes. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> uh, don't tell the story uh, on Monday that he's in the fish and wait till the next Monday and say that he was out of the fish because children will be <laughs> angry. No, <laughs> yeah. but, but these are not stories for children, for adults. So where do you start telling children about the Bible? Oh, there are many stories you can tell. Oh, you can't tell. I've been writing a children's Bible, yeah, and you can write. Well, okay. Perhaps uh, somebody else? Oh. As someone who spent a lot more time reading minutes and policy than fiction, how does the rest of this story about the angel from Babylon fit in? Is that just a made up story? That Which one? seems to give Where the. Ability. Where the envoy from Babylon comes yeah. and says, "Hey, the, po the sundials have all gone wrong." Uh, that's towards the that's the end of the chapter or the next chapter. No, they where when they come over to, they to visit Hezekiah, they that's, don't that's speak the about the sundial. They they come. Uh, Hezekiah is stupid to show them all his uh, his wealth, and then the prophet is not happy with that. But I I thought there was uh, some reference to them saying there is, isn't there somewhere? Oh, in Chronicles. Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's important. Don't mix these two stories. Don't mix the, the gospel stories. Don't do that. Because each gospel writer has his aim. And Chronicles has another, the writer of Chronicles has another aim than Kings. You compare it very closely, you will see that where uh, Kings is de describing David as the one who sins and so on and so on, and Solomon is the anti-David because Solomon is not that wise king, he's not wise in the eyes of the Lord, but that's another topic, yes. Uh, in, in Chronicles, all these negative things about David and, 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 and Solomon are gone. They're not there. And Chronicles is focusing on the construction of the temple by Solomon and not speaking about his thousand wives and so on and so on. Why? Because that was not useful because in the time of Chronicles there was no king anymore. There were only priests and there was a, a state of 
theocratic state of uh, priests and, and the temple had to be the center and the, the center of power and authority. And therefore, all the negative things about Solomon are being put under the table. Yeah. So don't mix yeah, and don't try to construct a new story with an element from Kings and an element from Chronicles, an element from Matthew and one from John. Keep them separately because they have a different agenda. I'm not saying that you have to accept what I say. I share only with you what I think that I have understood. Must, I hope that is clear. Huh? I'm not imposing my, my view. I will never do that because we are all free in our mind and in our speaking. So, but I share that what I think that I have understood. Uh, they will decide uh, upon that uh, next week, huh? <laughs> oh, ha Howard. Hi. Hi. Uh, finally, I see you. <laughs> Sorry, Howard. But... I'll comment, Bob, first. I'll watch a lot of fiction in some minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but uh, um, there's another story, but it's in First Kings. Sorry? There is another story, but it's in First Kings, not Second Kings. Yeah. So I hope that we can. Uh, uh, but it's the story where Elijah brings back to life a dead child. How do we read that? Can we read that in the same way you have read the prolongation of Hezekiah's life? Is there a parallel story to this one? Or do we accept that Elijah did in fact raise the dead? It's, it's a, a story that we take literally rather than one for which we look for some meaning. Well, that's it. Yeah. I was just going to say, Elisha, of course, raises two people. So we've got an even worse problem a few chapters <laughs> down the track. Yeah, well, you touch on a, a very difficult uh, problem for many Christians. Uh, who think with their common sense and they wonder how it is possible to rise a person from the dead. And we see it in Elijah doing it, Elisha doing it, even, and probably you refer to that one, when he is in a tomb and uh, a dead man is uh, uh, thrown to his corpse because uh, the uh, um, the Arameans are there and then uh, this man comes to life, life because he touched uh, storytelling storytelling what is the purpose of these stories is it we Greeks and Romans who want to know exactly what happened and how to explain it that is according to me not the truth the truth is the meaning the meaning in the Bible text all over the place. Meaning, meaning, that is the truth. And not exactly uh, this figure, uh, this situation, but I'm speaking for myself. Yes? Uh, I'm not going to, into the matter of resurrection. Or that, uh, I try to try and try and try to understand the meaning of it. And sometimes I find it, or think that I find it, and sometimes it remains a question mark. But allow me, uh, I mentioned David and Goliath, we don't have the time for it, but what I did with chapter 20 and chapter 18 and 19, yes, uh, if you take chapter 18 and 19, this war narrative, and you know your Bible, and they knew their Bible, they are so smart in making associations. And then there are quite a few num uh, elements in this war narrative with Sennacherib and Hezekiah that correspond to the war narrative of Goliath and David. So that you even can say that Sennacherib is Goliath. And the David, the Hezekiah, who was afraid in the beginning, yeah, corresponds to Saul, 
who was afraid and he didn't dare to do it. Yeah, and then David had to come up. And David fights with him with few words, only when they curse themselves. And it's a fight and he overcomes the man who represents the power of evil. Well, in the Sennacherib uh, uh, narrative, it's, there is no fight. It's words. It's a verbal war, a physical war. And, and I can, I have it here, but the time was too, too short. Yes, I can show you all the parallels between the two war narratives, where you evidently understand that finally, where Hezekiah was a magnificent king in the beginning, then all of a sudden he is uh, in, uh, in fear, in panic before this Assyrian king. And uh, <laughs> there is reason for it because he wiped out all the north of Israel and all the cities of uh, Judah with Hatsor and so on and so on. Yeah? Uh, they had reason to be afraid, but he needed the words of the prophet, the words of God, and then he came to his senses and then he developed himself where David says just a few sentences uh, like the Lord gave me uh, uh, the lion and the bear into my hand and I will few but in uh, the story of uh, the narrative of uh, Sennacherib you have a vocabulary uh, that is developed and developed and the message comes home but the interesting thing is what is the meaning of both narratives that whatever for the Bible reader in those days and today, eventually, whatever force and hostility is before you, the message is to stand up yeah, and mount up and, and, and uh, um, have faith, trust in God and, and put yourself into action, not wait until God does something, because that is Saul didn't dare, he was afraid. The big brothers of David were afraid, all Israel was afraid, but he stood up, yeah, and he went for it. And that is what we call uh, synergy, cooperation. What I understand is that God is waiting for us to take the initiative in fa fa uh, when we face dramas, difficulties, and so on and so on, and then he will step in. Uh, I told uh, Lyndon, uh, yesterday, uh, I had a, a master student, and uh, in the course uh, uh, of biblical uh, Old Testament theology, I gave them an assignment in the book of Samuel and said, Okay, take a chapter and uh, describe what God is doing, the theology of God in the book. And one took uh, David and Goliath and wrote the paper, yes, and, and God was doing this, and God and God. I challenge you. Read the text, and God is doing nothing. Nothing. It's David. He took the sling. He threw. He ran. He cut off. And he spoke, but he gave the honor to God. And, and this is meaning. Whether this story of David and Goliath, and now I'm, I'm risking something, yeah, effectively happened that way, I don't know. Because in 2 Samuel, there is a sentence saying that one of the heroes of David, Elkanah, killed Goliath. Was he resurrected? And then, of course, uh, uh, traditional theologians and so, they try to, 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 to find a solution in changing the Hebrew text. And then it's, some, some, it's the brother of uh, Goliath. Yeah? But that's not the way. We have these uh, stories in Samuel, double stories. Yeah, uh, you remember David in the in the cave? Yeah, and then he says, I'm your son and did, I didn't want to, uh, uh, and Saul uh, is there. And two chapters later, yeah, David uh, has uh, 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 the weapons of, of Saul and it's repeated. Uh, in Genesis, Abram, he, uh, says, he lies about his wife to Pharaoh, later to the Philistine uh, king. And Isaac does the same. Now the question is, this, did this happen the way it is being? It's a story. Why? For what purpose? 
to learn from it, not to do this. Three times, when you see it three times in a Bible book or in a chapter or so, then you know that the, the writer is putting emphasis, but I should stop on it. Rudy, I was fascinated only a little while ago when I was preparing a lesson uh, on Hezekiah. It was when we were studying the book of Isaiah. Uh, I had long known about Hezekiah's sickness and about the siege of Jerusalem with Sennacherib. But I'd never realised that the two were happening at the same time. And I have to say, poor old Hezekiah had my very great sympathy. What a, what a short straw to draw. You know, your country has been decimated, your city is surrounded, and then you, you're afflicted with a fatal disease. He must have felt fairly deserted by God, mustn't he, at, at one stage? Yeah. Let me... Um, I don't know whether you have been thinking, I mentioned it, um, how do you resolve the difference between the 10 steps and the 15 years added? Yeah, it got 15 years extra. Yeah, and it's there in the text. You can find it. In the 14th year, Sennacherib comes. Yes, and if, if, uh, you accept that this explanation makes sense, that the shadow is symbolizing Sennacherib, yes, then 10 steps from the 14th year. If you read in the beginning of chapter 18, Salmanasar, the, the predecessor of uh, Sennacherib, he comes with his army and he wipes out uh, the nor northern kingdom. In the fourth year, of Hezekiah. Fourth year, fourteenth year. In other words, the shadow of the Assyrians was there from the fourth year of Hezekiah up to the fourteenth year, and in the fourteenth year the drama developed and was being solved. And scripture explains itself. I didn't I don't don't need the big theologians, just text. Um, I had a reputation, I told uh, Lyndon uh, when uh, a student uh, handed in his uh, final paper in his master's, yes, uh, with Professor Van Moore, it is the text, the text and the text. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Rudy. That, look, we will call it a halt here. There's yeah. going to be plenty of time for chatting if we do that. So I won't be turning the lights out or coughing loudly or anything like that for another... 25 minutes or half an hour and there are lots of people who I'm sure are going to want to say hi but we'll ask you to give us a benediction now and that will bring our meeting formally to a close Dear God, Lord of the universe King of our lives we are so grateful that you care about us and you show that in giving us these texts from your inspired writers who help us to draw lessons for life, for happiness, for relationship, for hope, for support. Dear Lord, thank you for being with us and help us to understand it. Help us to encourage each other to read the Bible more properly trying to understand it better so that we can also witness about your love, love you expressed in so many ways and also in Jesus of Nazareth. We thank you for this meeting. We thank you for all the benedictions and the blessings we have received from you and also for this Sabbath. Amen. Amen.